Hello everybody, this is Dan, and I am here to introduce you to computability theory. And today I'm going to discuss the most foundational and the most important machine of our own in theoretical computer science, Mr. Turing Machine, aka the Turing Machine. So, many of you may not even know what this machine is to begin with. The Turing machine, if you want a basic understanding of what a Turing machine does, a Turing machine is basically anything like this computer here. This computer here is what we would call Turing equivalent. But I would note that a Turing machine is much more powerful than than this current machine I'm... Yeah, right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a Turing machine, by definition, is what we call an automaton, which has a specific set of properties. Actually, originally it was a logical machine developed by Alan Turing, who is the father of computer science. But let me just define what a Turing machine is, and then we'll talk a little bit more fun about the goodies. Okay, a Turing machine M, and has a 7-tuple, which those are different parameters, which may have different properties. And I'm going to run through each one of these things for you, just to have a basic understanding of what the heck a Turing machine is, and we'll discuss why the heck this thing's important. Okay, a Turing machine, M equals Q, sigma, gamma, delta, Q0. I use the blank symbol, a.k.a. null, and F. Where Q is a set of states, right there, as I say, right there. Okay, Q, at, when I mean a set of states, I mean a state from some input symbol. Like, okay, suppose we're going to picture a Turing machine as this device that reads its infinitely long tape. Left and right, there's an infinitely long tape. And Q is the number of number one of these symbols that can represent a state. So like on each one of these, think of it like a film strip. You can go left and right on the film strip when you roll it up and roll it down. The set Q is each one of those cells. There may be an infinite amount of them, but the thing is we're caring more about the finite one finite symbols. Okay, so now next to our thing. Okay, sigma is a set of input symbols. The thing that the almost distinguished between a sigma and gamma is that this is an input symbol from, say, you, the user, or, say, the algorithm that we're feeding this machine to do some specific task. And the reason why this is a subset, and when I mean a subset, I mean everything that is an input symbol is inside the set of the tape symbols. And when I mean the tape, I mean this long, infinitely long tape that is out there, and it's going to transition between each one of these cells, like film strip, like when you go left and right on it. But the set of tape symbols, on the other hand, is anything. It includes the stack, like, because a Turing machine actually has a stack, you can put with symbols stacking on each other. And the thing about it is it combines the stack and the input symbols. So that's why this important property is here. Anyway, so now we have the tape symbols. The tape symbols gamma. This is a set of symbols which the machine may use, which are on each one of these states, and, they're pre and the machine predetermines and puts the symbols, supposing like you had a program out and you loaded it. The Turing machine will come along and be running across and saying, okay, I'm at this state. Okay, transition to the right. Now we're at this state. Now we keep going along, and we do it this way over and over again until we reach to the last symbol, which is most likely a blank symbol. Usually, usually the input ends on a blank symbol. Okay, next, delta. Delta is a, in using an automaton or any type of theoretical machine, we typically use delta to determine as a transition function between between, say, a moving from one state to another given on some sort of input, whether it be a stack or an input symbol. This one is mostly determined on this current state, which could be a stack or an input symbol, which, because what happens with... Here, I'll explain very shortly. Okay, so the transition is on a left or a right move. So you either can move left or right on this infinitely long tape. So you can go, loop, or you can go, loop, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and given on some sort of some sort of tape symbol, so something inside of gamma. And 
one thing to always remember is that whenever you do a transition, you're actually going to overwrite the current symbol, most likely. You can optional, it's a very optional thing. You can either put the symbol on, or you can rewrite and move. Okay, next. Now we get to the easy ones. Okay, Q0. That's the start state. That's where the, the, the read head on this thing. Okay, like think of it like the film strip. We wind it out. Whatever the middle cell that we're looking at, that's the read head. So whenever we move it left or right, the read head is in the middle. Let's just call it that the origin. And we'll call that Q0. That's where the original origin is. No note that Q0 is not always that middle. Q0 is just the beginning of that roll that we start the leftmost symbol in the in our system. Okay, null is the is the null symbol, which is basically any blank symbol. And once we reach one of those, we may potentially halt. We may not halt, but you never know exactly what's going on with these Turing machines. Sometimes you encounter things like you would see in a programming language, like an infinite loop, for example. And that's going to be an important fact. Okay, and F is a set of fine of uh, accepting states. So uh, an accepting state is when the machine finally says, okay, I'm done, let's halt. When it's done building it, running its program. Otherwise it's rejected when it reaches a blank symbol. Okay, so now, why with all this information, now we have the, the Turing machine defined. So remember, number of states, alphabet of input symbols, as a tape alphabet, which contains everything that's in here, delta, is the transition start state blank final states okay now why the heck am I telling you this thing and I mentioned it and give you a little bit of a hint okay so currently this machine in computer science we consider it as one of the most important things considering this thing basically founded most of the, the theoretical field since this was a very important concept in in the 20th century, when we're dealing with the problem in formal mathematics involving three factors. Uh, completeness, uh, decidability, and consistency. And these things all have their different properties. And say, when you take completeness, completeness is involving, if you have a, set, a, a logical system, can you prove everything that you state? And that means, like, for example, if I state, okay, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. That's a, then you prove it, then, yes, yeah, so, so what? Now you proved it. But one thing that's important about this thing, this thing shows that you cannot determine prehand whether a program will halt or not. Or you can take this as transitive, that if you give, if, suppose you made a tr proof-making machine. This was, a, was uh, involving uh, a problem that David Hilbert proposed originally in the early 1900s was involving a problem in mathematics we were dealing with contradictions. 